Good afternoon, Merrill. Thank you for having me today. And Alexis, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here at this interface of the uh, wonderful work that CHD has done on behalf of all of us on the planet uh, with regard to medicine and teaching us what's some of the real, what's really going on underneath the veil of modern medicine. And I, today I, we feel it's really important to make the connection to food and in a way what happened to food and how that underpins the ability of the global corporatized somewhat fascist economy to, to manage now our bodies medically. Um, so I'd first like to add a bit more to, uh, to where Alexis left off, which is um, that the modern attack on food and agriculture has, has been and continues to be an attack on sovereign cultures, communities, and peoples. This attack is the key tenet of centralized uh, global capitalism and has been, been designed to create dependence on fiat currencies backed by the US dollar. Henry Kissinger's famous quote sums up the strategy. Who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls the energy can control whole continents. And who controls money can control the world. Ultimately, for this global economy to achieve growth using the gross domestic product metric, it needs maximum participation. That means it means it needs as many of us as possible to be consumers, to depend on money to buy the things we need. Um, and the, the real threat that, uh, th that they see here are people and communities who produce their own food, plant-based medicines, and re renewable goods for shelter and clothing, especially those who do this outside of the context of fiat currency or whose currency circulates in a decentralized manner. This has always been what's con been considered a real threat to a centralized economic system. Um, and in a way, we can trace this model uh, to the Federalist model originally brought to bear by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison in the Federalist Papers. This model promoted a strong centralized government that assumed national and state debts, passed tax laws, and created a central bank. Um, this Federalist model, incidentally, was much more adverse to free speech, decentralized agrarian economies, and strong state and individual rights. Um, the original model really brought to bear by Thomas Jefferson really wanted to see a strong agrarian population empowered on their own land and in charge of their own production. Um, and today, much of this philosophy uh, is really gone the Federalist way. Um, the, uh, this, the Federalist model sort of underpins the central uh, international order financed by the US dollar uh, with powerful instruments and institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and World Health Organization to further spread the system's influence and power. So, I'm, so I say all that really to preface that farmers, especially people and communities who can control their own food systems, um, are more free from this system. Um, and, and as Alexis Baden-Meyer pointed out so well, there was a strategized approach to reduce the number of farms in the United States so that more of the supply came from fewer farms and that the supply of food itself represented a narrow scope of commodities. Um, those commodities, incidentally, have been uh, the agrochemicals uh, developed to, uh, to control pests and weeds, pesticides and herbicides, uh, and also the genetically genetic modification technology in much of the seed is really geared towards corn and soy. So if you think of the whole world, we have small farmers growing diverse sets of foods. In, in fact, if you really think of agriculture, uh, it's, a, it's really people's own cultures and how it relates to their food production. And we have had diverse diets at the community level around this planet, appropriate for the local climates and the long cultures that many people have developed with. A centralized global economy really depends on us all moving towards the same commodities. And of course, for a, a global economy to grow in the way that, uh, especially use of the American dollar to grow, we want dependence on our you know, industrial food commodities. So there has been a movement for the past uh, really heated up from the Green Revolution and, and still um, in full force now to in developing so-called developing countries to get farmers off their land and into cities 
And this is usually led by, uh, inter by in the International Monetary Fund or it, it's loans from international funds often stipulate to countries. I'll use, uh, I'll use Haiti as an example. In order to get uh, IMF loans in 1994, President Jean-Bertrand Aristide was forced to uh, drop the tariff uh, the, on, on imported rice. Haiti had charged a 47% tariff on imported rice to protect their own rice producers who produced enough rice for the whole country. Um, Bill Clinton and the IMF uh, made Aristide in order to get money to rebuild the country after a coup uh, to drop that tariff to 3% and the country was flooded with American commodity rice, um, coincidentally from Arkansas. And that uh, succeeded in kind of wiping out most of the Haitian rice producing industry, which was all small farms who uh, worked worked together to uh, to grow rice for the country. Um, and the same story can be seen over and over again. I was just in Jamaica where IMF loans to Jamaica basically made Jamaica dependent upon imported American grains and imported rice. Um, and but there's enough land in Jamaica fallow to produce all these commodities or other foods for itself. But instead, the, it's now two generations displaced from people eating a different way, and the population has become dependent on these commodities we send. And it would be a long process to, uh, and, and we're fighting against very powerful interests to retake uh, over that uh, control of the food supply there. Um, right now in Mexico, um, President Manuel Luis Obrador in Mexico has uh, made spearheaded a very strong effort to ban genetically modified corn and soy um, from the United States or just GMOs in general and the associated chemical glyphosate that's used to um, control weeds in corn and soy, GMO corn and soy. Um, and he's facing huge pressure from the United States from um, who are threatening to take him to trade court. Uh, Tom Vilsack made his first foreign visit to fly to Mexico to pressure Obrador not to do this. And this is because uh, the Mexican government looks at corn and the integrity of its original genetics and the and as themselves as the breadbasket of corn. And that the genetically modified corn and its pollen that comes from the US and, and now other places threatens to destroy the very origins of this, of the, their staple food of Mexico. And he looks at it as a national security issue. Um, incidentally, it's also an issue of sovereignty. The U.S. flooding, uh, fl flooding the Mexican uh, market with corn started after the signing of the NAFTA agreement. And this, um, th this really destroyed the local economy of Mexican farmers producing their own corn um, and, and providing their own country with food. It also destroyed many of the original open pollinated varieties of corn. So we can see kind of bringing it back to how a lot of the effort um, that's already on, not fully uh, complete in the US, but the effort to remove small farmers and more sovereign or community based food systems from the land base is all about getting people to move from from small farms into the as as um, Alexis's presentation pointed out, move the manpower into the manufacturing economy, but also into being consumers who need fiat currency underpinned by the US dollar. So today, we, while this effort is, uh, is, is being made from sort of the center of the global economy, farms all around the world, small farmers know what they're up against. And they're much more aware of it because they're having to survive it than we are aware of it. And there are efforts all over the world to uh, to really come back from the from the brink, uh, and many many more of them will be highlighted in further presentations um, ahead of us. Um, I'd like to highlight a couple um, a couple sort of attacks on food as well, so that you can understand or start to see um, how some of this can be perverted. Um, and and when we see things in the media that are really about uh, that. That, that try to attack the small farm movement and make it look like we're part of the problem. It's often part of a bigger context. Um, and I'm going to use an example that's occurring, uh, that occurred in Indonesia, where um, there was a failed effort to make Indonesia grow, go organic. 
Um, and uh, in fact, what happened was uh, Indonesia was bankrupt and there had been a, they had built a staged long-term plan to transition to organic over time to empower their small farmers, make them less dependent on foreign inputs and, um, and, and not need uh, some imported synthetic chemicals and also to make the country healthier. Um, but there was a tremendous financial mismanagement in the country by President Rajapstra. Um, and they arbitrarily, uh, they didn't purchase fertilizer that was usually distributed to, to farmers. And they arbitrarily said they're just going organic overnight. Uh, of course, it was a disaster. The farms weren't ready or trained or organized around organic techniques yet. Um, and so, and production plummeted. Um, and this is all because soils were not given time to rebuild and, uh, and small farmers were not given the opportunity to, to retrain themselves in organic methods or be trained. Um, so the global media attacked this as organic, far, you know, organic farming fails to feed uh, Indonesia. Uh, organic farming is a threat to, uh, threat to the world's food supply, et cetera. And you'll often see examples made of regenerative, organic, and community-based farming um, saying that it can't feed us. Um, but the truth is, is that um, much of our land base has been transitioned away from the types of community-based food systems to corn and soy. Um, and the communities where they haven't been transitioned away are under direct attack. And we need to find ways to, to counter this. Um, so a, a few examples will be given, given later today of how, how communities have banded together to move on from these, these struggles. Um, but I'd really like to sum up my, my talk with uh, an explanation of really some of how we can move our way way out of this um, and what regenerative organic and, and you know effective original community uh, based food systems look like. Um, and really this comes down to, to how land and communities function. So if you think about our, our landscapes, we all live in watersheds and watersheds have historically per, you know, supported the communities of all life within them by collecting water, storing water, distributing water. Watersheds often contain farmed areas, soils, et cetera, and the communities that live in them. And the most important thing is that organic and regenerative systems and communities manage their own cycles within these watersheds. They manage their own carbon and nitrogen cycles. They also manage their own nutrient cycles by using compost and local waste. Animal manures, even in past history, managed human manure drove our systems at the community level. Um, and we, and it also drove a diversity of crops. So appropriate carbon and nitrogen cycling does not work with monocrops of corn and soybeans. They work with multiple inter, uh, interplanted species and long developed agricultural indigenous knowledge developed in the community and local level for hundreds and hundreds of years. So when, uh, so these are the systems that we've had to rebuild as organic farmers and regenerative farmers. And in many parts of the world, these systems are still clinging on at the community and small farmer level, despite being under attack from centralized global economic system. And we really need to understand that organic and regenerative agriculture is about communities and people at the appropriate scale to their landscape coming back together to manage our own carbon nutrient cycles, water cycles, to grow diverse food at a small scale and eat it directly and trade it as directly as possible. Because when we eat commodified food that's based on corn or soy, we are actually driving the underpinning of the global economy, which is industrial food. Industrial food leads to an unhealthy body that leads to the need for industrial modern medicine. So this is what uh, this sort of sums up the attack on small farms. And we actually need to really retrain our minds to understand that small farms are premised upon small, direct organic management of our local ecosystems, um, social ecosystems, as in person to person and human eater to farmer connections, but also um, you know, the local ecosystem itself in which forests, streams, farm fields are all managed um, nutrients and crops to, uh, to optimize the health of our food and the health of our soils and now climate. 
So with that, I'd really like to, to, uh, to pass this back to Merrill. I thank everyone for the opportunity to speak with you today and look forward to the rest of the symposium.